journey to get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. Fear you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Fear you won't define me, cause that's what my together in the Father's house this morning. Amen, amen. So let's come together now. Let's lift our voices again and sing that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my portion. You are my portion, excuse me. You are my hiding place. And I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe through 
verse we've claimed for the last eight and a half years since we started the church, Ephesians 3.20. If you know it, say it with me. It says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. I hope today you've come today expecting great things. I hope today maybe you're wanting more. Would you say it with me this morning? Would you say, I, I want, want more? more. Just think about that. God can do greater things than we can ask or think. We're glad you came this morning to Fayette Baptist. And we'll give you some, uh, some great options. You can greet each other how you want. You, could give, you can look over and you can give the old air nod like, hey, what's up? What's up? You can give the uh, air high five across the room. Hey, what's up to the other side of the room? You can give fist bump, elbow bump, or shake hands. But greet one another this morning. Let them know you're glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning as we continue to worship. Jesus is alive and he is king, amen. Sing. There's a reason. There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now for here. Jesus is alive. Amen. There's a reason. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the night. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. Sing, praise the King. Praise the King. There's a reason why our 
hearts can be courageous. There's a reason why the dead are made alive. There's a reason why we share his resurrection. Jesus is alive. Yeah. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. Praise the King.
praise the name of Jesus this morning. He is worthy of our praise. Amen. You may be seated. From the darkness I called your name Into darkness your mercy came You called me out, lifted me up How great is your love You bore my weakness, you took my shame Buried my burdens in fields of grace. You called me out. You lifted me up. How great is your love. From the heights of heaven, you stepped down to earth. Innocent perfection gave your life. We stand in awe, for we have been changed by the power of the cross. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love for us.
How great is your love for us. Father, today we know that your love is so great, God. Your love is so big. And we're so thankful to worship a God who is so almighty. Today we give you all of our praise. We give you all of our worship. You are so deserving, God. As we read in Life Group this morning. God, taken upon the wrath of all mankind, God. You bore it on the Savior's back. God, your love is so big. Your love is so strong. Your love is so mighty. And we declare this morning that there is nothing my God cannot do. There is nothing you cannot do. You are unmovable, unshakable, unchanging, unwavering. God, although the, ver the earth vexes sour, you are still the same God. Yesterday, today, and forever. And today we worship you, Lord. We worship you knowing these great things. And Father, today I pray for my dear pastor as he comes and prays and preaches for us this morning. God, would you speak through him? Would you use this time to glorify the name of your son, Jesus? And God, as we respond, I pray that you would open our hearts, God, that we would be receptive to the words of the scriptures. And God, I pray that, Lord, this morning you would convict lives. I pray that you would change hearts. And Lord, these things we ask in the magnificent name of Jesus, the name above all names. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. We good? We getting it? Can y'all hear that? Is that better? We there? I'm still not hearing, but maybe, there we go. Okay, awesome, cool deal. Nehemiah chapter 8, if you love praising the Lord, can we just get a big shout of amen real quick? Amen. Man, listen, that is good stuff right there. And we need to praise the Lord, but I'm excited about reading for the word. If you're excited about reading from God's word, would you say amen? amen. So we're going to have God's word right now. If you've got God's word, I want you to put it up in the air real quick. Put it up in the air. We got it? Yes, lots of copies of God's Word. Listen, God's Word is awesome, and we're going to look at what, what God's Word says today, and it's centered around God's Word. I love when the text is centered around the Word of God, and that's what we're going to read about today. There's a lot of cool stuff we're going to see from Nehemiah, but when you think about the Bible and you think about God's Word, there's a lot of interesting facts and details that you may not know about God's Word I want to share with you real quick. So just some cool stats. In night, as of 1995, uh, the Guinness Book of World Records said that over 5 billion copies of God's Word had been sold, okay? It's the, the most sold book of all time, most read book of all time, and the, the second place book, I don't know if you can guess or not, Don Quixote, any of you ever read that before? 500 million copies sold, that's how far from the Bible, we see the second place book. So it's a book that's been sold. It's a book that's been read like crazy. Every year, over 100 million copies of the Word of God are, are bought by people. It's pretty amazing. The world's smallest Bible. wonder if you know what the world's smallest Bible is. It's actually the Nano Bible, okay? And uh, it, you can see the, the picture there. And if you look on the bottom left of that screen, you can see a, a, a little finger there with a little dot. The Nano Bible is a gold-plated silicone chip, and it's the size of a pinhead. That's right. And it was created in 2015, the entire Bible on that little speck right there. Now, on the flip side, the world's largest Bible. In 1926, okay, Louis Winay, he, built, he, he created a Bible, a King James Bible. It is four feet tall. Eight feet wide, and it weighs over 1,000 pounds. Now, if somebody brings that Bible in here, you're going to have a hard time opening it up in your seat, okay? But feel free to bring it in if you want. It's an awesome copy of God's Word. The Bible is also the most stolen book in the world. Can you, can you guess where it gets stolen from the most? Hotels. That's like some of you probably stole a Bible from a hotel, okay? So 
we understand that the Bible is unique in itself. Uh, the, the longest word in the Bible, Isaiah's son, in Isaiah 8, verse 3. Now, I'm not even going to begin to try to pronounce this, but I can say the word apothecary, okay, just so you guys will know, all right? And so, yes, I'm still with you on there. We're still tracking, but I'm not going to try to pronounce that word. But world, the, the, the Bible, the longest word in the Bible, the last word in the Bible, can you guess what the last word is? Amen. Okay, last word in the Bible is amen. The uniqueness of the Bible, 40 authors over 2,000 years from three different continents, from three different languages, forming 66 books into one message that syncs up perfectly with no mistakes. Listen, that is our God. That is the word of God. That is the Bible. Check this out, though. We're privileged here to have several copies of God's word. God's word has been translated in 701 languages, okay? 701 languages with the Bible. Right now, there are 2,736 languages where the translation is in progress. But as good as those things are, it's sad to know that while we're here today and we have a copy of God's word, that over 2,000 different languages as we speak today have no copy of no scripture in their language. Now, can you imagine... Wanting to know about God, but not having a copy of God's word to read from. And when you think about that, an estimated at least 171 million people today, they don't have access to a copy of God's word. They don't have a translation in their language. And folks, today, we're blessed to have a copy of God's word. And in Nehemiah chapter 8, we talked about in, in chapter 7, that this thing's kind of been progressing. Okay, Nehemiah returned to start things off, and that was a big step. But then he went on to begin to rebuild, and we saw for several chapters what that rebuilding of that wall looked like around Jerusalem. And it took a while, but they ended up getting the wall built in 52 days. And last week we looked at after the wall was built, because honestly, he didn't really come to build a wall. He came to help rebuild a people of God, and that's why he was there. And so in order to do that, it had to move from return to rebuild to reestablish, and some things took place. He passed off the leadership to two guys. One of which was faithful, the other which that feared God. And so these were the things he was looking for, but he also secured the borders. And he made sure that there wasn't just a wall up, but there was a security team in place. And he gave the specific instructions that, hey, I don't want you to open up those, these doors early in the morning. I want you to wait till midday to open the doors up. And I want you to close it in the evening. And I want, to, want you to make sure that things are tight and secure. And he went on to read this genealogy, and we saw nine different groups of people a bunch of folks there that had a specific role in place in that situation. And so now we're at the place where after, after a while this thing's finished up, that we're moving into the Word of God in Nehemiah chapter 8. Because here's the reality for all of us. If we're going to reestablish our lives spiritually, it's impossible for your life and my life to be reestablished without God's Word. Okay? God's word is what leads us and teaches us to reestablish our ways. When we get off trail, when we get off, off in la-la land, guess what? We can always come back to God's word and it speaks truth to our life. And so here in God's word, we're going to get to see what that looks like in Nehemiah chapter 8, starting in verse 1. So this is what God's word says in verse 1. And all the people gathered themselves together. Say gathered. As one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spoke unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. So the first thing I want you to jot down is this. Man, there was a gathering around God's word. There was a gathering around the word. Now, I don't know if you know what's unique about this, but now Ezra has entered in back, to the, back into the scene. He's been out the entire book. And now that, that Nehemiah has passed things off, Ezra's come back on the scene, this scribe priest, and they've asked him to bring the, the book of the law to read. And so when you think about that and you think about where this gathering took place, we looked at some maps uh, not too long ago, and I want to throw this back up on the screen to you. If you look on the, on the east wall towards the south, you'll notice the water gate, okay, the water gate. In Scripture it says that's where they gathered together, okay. Now that's important for this reason. This was an all-inclusive gathering, okay? Amen. Yes, it was an all-inclusive gathering, okay? And listen, 
there were kids and adults and everybody there, and they were having a good time, and that's important for this reason. When you initially hear that, you think, well, how come they didn't meet up at the temple? I mean, that would be the obvious place where the Word of God should be read, wouldn't it? Well, the issue at hand is this. There was restrictions up near the temple, if you remember, okay? There's a, a place for the women to enter where the Gentiles were, where the Israelites were, where the priests were, and so things were kind of segmented off, and so basically we see here the people are saying, hey, let's gather together, and that water gate represents this, that the Word of God is for everybody, okay? The Word of God is for everyone to hear, and, and when you notice that, you see it's also near the Gihon Spring, okay? This spring today it still bubbles up and gushes out water if you were to go to Jerusalem. And when you think about that, go back to that map where that screen is. I want us to look at God's word right there. What does it say in John 14, 13 through 14? It says this, Jesus said unto her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 7, 37 through 38 says this, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What, what essentially was taking place here is this, when they gathered around to hear God's word, they did that at this water gate, and that was just a picture of this. Everybody's invited to hear God's word. And if anybody wants to partake of that word, there's something new and fresh that will take place in your life that only Jesus can bring. Listen, when we gather around the word, we get to experience that, amen? Listen, this is what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. And I want to relay this again, and I think especially during this time period we're in, we need to be reminded of what God's word says. It says, and let us consider one another to provoke and to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Listen, there are certain things that only happen in your life and my life spiritually when we all come together physically around God's Word. You don't get those things according to God's Word. You're not going to get provoked to good works. You're not going to get provoked to love more unless you come together physically with the body of Christ centered around God's Word. That's what they were doing right there. And listen, it was an all-inclusive deal. Hey, this is not a segmented deal. This is everybody come to the gathering place to hear from the Word of God. Now listen, we're privileged to do that on a regular basis, but I believe one of the things that we've seen this past year is this. We oftentimes take for granted the gathering together around God's Word. We miss out on gathering together with God's Word. Listen, I'm just going to be honest. When I'm not in church on Sunday, gathered with other believers around God's Word, something just feels off in my life. I don't feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be unless I'm physically together with my brothers and sisters in Christ. You know why? Because all day today, from the time I got here to the time I just got to preach, whether it was someone in the hall or someone in life group, or a song on the stage, or whatever we're doing right now, all that stuff has done two things. It's provoked me to good works and to love more. And I would have missed those things if I wouldn't have been here. So we're called to gather around God's Word. Listen, all around the world, it's a special occasion to gather around God's Word. Because for many people, it's a huge sacrifice. It's something they don't take for granted. And throughout this message, you're going to see little quick clips of what this looks like, looks like outside of the United States when people get to center their life around God's Word and get a piece of God's Word. I want you to check out this video of this village that gets to receive God's Word for the first time. Watch this.
so right now there's people sacrificing all over the world, and they're walking, doing different things just to get to a gathering around God's word. And listen, we gather around a lot of stuff every single week. For many of us, we gather, we gather with other people around sports. We gather with other people around food. We gather with other people around work. We gather with other people around the movie. We gather with other people. We might meet with our family. And listen, all those things are good in themselves. But listen, none of those things compare to gathering around God's word. And when you see in Scripture they met to gather, I mean, this was important to them. This was, this was the real deal. And it wasn't just the fact that they were gathering around God's word. There was a hunger for God's word. If you notice what it said there, it says that the people called Ezra to bring the book of the law. Hey, Ezra, we want you to bring God's word here. We want to hear what you have to say, and we want to hear the word. Now, when you think about that, what are you hungry for when you gather around the word? Are you hungry to hear God's word? Listen, we've said it before, we'll say it again, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Last night. I finished up something out in Carville, and I was heading home, and I had a hankering for something to eat, so I pulled off to Arby's to get an Arby's roast beef sandwich. I love Arby's. Arby's is good. And so I pulled around, and when I was pulling around, I decided that I wanted to get a milkshake in addition to my roast beef sandwich. So I got my roast beef. I got my milkshake. I got in the car. I began to drive home, and then I began to drink my milkshake, and the milkshake was incredible. It was a chocolate milkshake. I know you want a milkshake right now. It was great. And so I ate the milkshake. It was good. But here's what happened. When I finished eating the milkshake, I wasn't hungry anymore for the roast beef sandwich. So the milk took place of the meat. And if we're not careful many times, here's what happens. We're going to fill up on all the things that the world has to offer that's milk, and we're going to miss the meat of God's word. And oftentimes when we come to church, the reason we're not hungry to hear this book is because we've come filled up on other things that the world has to offer. And Ezra right there is, is speaking God's word, and the people are saying, hey, you bring the book of the law. I want you to teach God's word, and they're ready for it because, folks, there's nothing like filling up on truth. There's a lot of things over the years that have said, hey, this is truth. There's a lot of skeptics out there around the origins and the content of God's word. Some of those things I've got on the screen I want you to see is people look back and say, well, no, it, it, they, they look at someone like Homer or Plato or Caesar and they go back to those specific writings and those dates and say, well, this is truth. This is what we can trust. How do we know we can trust the Bible? And they look back at those things and you see that graph on what was brought out there. And at the end on the far right, you see the number of copies of those specific writings. And people will tap those and say, hey, this is truth. This is truth. But yet they'll denounce the Bible as being the truth of God's word. But yet when you look there and you see the New Testament, look down there at the number of copies we had of the New Testament. 5,366. And for many people that are out there, listen, they are searching for the truth and they're looking in all different places trying to fill up, but eventually, guess what happens? It ends in emptiness. Only God's word can truly fill us up. And so there was a hunger for God's word. What happened after they gathered around to hear the word of God? Look in verse 2. Verse 2 and 3 says this, And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both of men and women. And all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street, that was before the water gate, from the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand. It wasn't just a gathering around God's word. It wasn't just a hunger for God's word. There was a reading of God's word. When they came together, they didn't just come and hang out and fellowship. Man, they heard from the word of God. Now, how long did they hear from God's word? What does it say there? It says from morning until midday. I mean, when they came, they're literally hearing the reading of God's word for five to six hours. Now, I know y'all get excited and we're just hoping that when you showed up today that we could listen to God's word for five to six hours. But the reality is this, for many of us, once the clock gets to past 30 minutes in the sermon, we're honestly in our mind going, I wish the preacher would be quiet because I'm ready to fill up on some food at the local restaurant. Can I get a witness? You don't have to say that, I already know it, okay? 
So we're already there. We're being honest. And here's what's happened, folks. Because we don't have a hunger and desire for God's word, when the reading of God's word comes out, we oftentimes just check out. But he's reading God's word for five to six hours. Who all was he reading to? And he was saying he could read, he was reading everybody that could understand. No doubt there were little ones in the crowd. There were families of all shapes and sizes. But they were there, thousands upon thousands there at the water gate. And they were hearing the reading of God's word. When did they read God's word? They read it on the first day of the seventh month. Now what's so significant about that day and that month? Well, it was harvest time. And there was an early harvest and a late harvest if you know much about Israel and that time period. And this was the Jewish New Year, September, October. If you looked at the Hebrew calendar, it was called Teshra or Heshvan. And there were three important things that took place in that month. The first one was the Feast of the Trumpets, or the first day of the year. And you can see this in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 23 through 25. You often hear it called Rosh Hashanah. And I'm going to ask uh, one of our very own members, Jimmy Jordan, if he would, to come up here on stage real quick. And I've asked Jimmy to come because Jimmy played the trumpet in college at Lambeth. Yes, back when Lambeth existed, okay? He, uh, he played uh, the trumpet, and uh, man, he's an awesome guy. And, and when you think about Rosh Hashanah and you think about the Feast of the Trumpets and what they did, I mean, there was some specific history there, and there were specific reasons that they pulled out that trumpet. And if if you don't know what the trumpet was then, oftentimes it was called a shofar. Anybody ever heard what a shofar is? Okay, there was a shofar, it was a ram's horn. And oftentimes they would blow this ram's horn, and it had different significant things that they would do. But essentially on this feast of the trumpets, man, there would be food, there would be anticipation, and it was almost like we're preparing for the presence of God. And when they would prepare for the presence of God, they would oftentimes get trumpets out and they would blow the trumpet. And the trumpet would have different meanings for different lengths or different beats. And up on the screen, I want you to see there were four different types of, of trumpet blows, so to speak, that they had that were specific to specific different instances. The first one was called the takia. And I'm going to have him here in just a second go through all four of them. But I want to explain real quick. The takia was the first one. And it was a long blast, and many times this was used in battle. And this, was the, this emphasized the beginning of something new. The, sh the, shiver, the shivarnan were three short blasts, and these were representing intermittent cries of brokenness. The third was the tarun. These were nine staccato blasts and were essentially like praises before the Lord. And the fourth was the, the takia galdoa, this was a grand blast, and it represented a long wail of repentance. And so with that being said, I've asked Jimmy, if he would, to, to go through those different progressions of each of those four things right now. And so, Jimmy, would you please play the takia right now? So that was oftentimes used when a battle would begin or to set something in order, something new. The second was called the Shavernan, the Shavurim. And it was three short blasts, which were intermittent cries of brokenness. Go ahead and play that. So those represented something different with the Feast of the Trumpets. The third one was the Tarum. This was the nine staccato blasts, and they represented praises before the Lord. That was incredible. I don't know how you did that right there. <laughs> and then the last was the Takia Gal Galdoa, and this was the grand blast. This was the long blast, and it represented a wailing of repentance, of brokenness. And so I'm looking forward to the Takia Galdoa. So go ahead and play that, Jimmy. Amen. Give Jimmy a hand for that stuff right there. You know what's awesome? There's going to be another trumpet blast when Jesus comes back for his people. Amen. And so when you think about the trumpet blast, listen, it was a preparation for God's presence. In Exodus chapter 19, 
What do we see at, at Mount Sinai there? We, we see this, this trumpet blast and this beginning of the people of Israel experiencing God's presence there as that cloud uh, came up and you see the thunder and lightning. And so throughout Scripture, trumpets had a very important meaning. And you see this with the, the Feast of the Trumpets, okay? The Feast of the Trumpets. What else do we have there? We have the Feast of Atonement. And this was the 10th day of the month, the Feast of Atonement. This was found in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 27. You may have heard it called Yom Kippur. And this was an opportunity, essentially, for people to prepare the way of no work. And there was prayer and fasting. And it was essentially the reminder of the sacrifice that God made. And so in this take place, there was repentance and sorrow constantly around the crowd and the group as they remembered the sacrifice that God made for them on the cross. Next was the Feast of the Tabernacles or Booths. And this was on the 15th day of the month, and it was oftentimes called Sakat. And this Feast of the Tabernacles or Booth was essentially a time where they would go outside and they would construct different booths with some thatch and different palm branches on top, and they would do this each year. And it was a reminder of, of God taking them out of Egypt. And through those years in the wilderness, and it was a, a, a feast and great celebration as they were reminded of who God is and what he has done in their life. And folks, we need to be reminded of that in our life as well. And we're reminded of that when we read God's word. And so there was three specific things that we see there. Check out this video in another group that got to experience God's word for the first time. This is a rural area of Henan province in China's heartland. The nearest city is about an hour's drive away. People here are poor, earning less than 150 US dollars a year from their wheat and corn crops. Many of Henan's 3.8 million Christians live in remote rural areas like this and find it very hard to get Bibles. That is why hundreds of people from the surrounding areas flocked to the church in this small village when they heard that a Bible distribution van would be visiting. The van was welcomed into the village like a celebrity. Bible Society representatives handed out 700 Bibles to rural Christians. For many, it was the first Bible they had ever owned. For many of the Christians who are owning the Bible for the first time, especially in the villages, in the rural areas, yeah, you could see tears in their eyes, you could see you know, joy uh, and gratitude. Yeah. Some of them would come up to me and to us, to thank us for giving this precious gift of the Bible. I mean, I've met people who have been waiting for the Bible for the last 10 years, 14 years, and uh, they are precious, yeah. What was their response when they started hearing God's word being read? Look what it says at the end of verse 3. It says, And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Listen, there was an attention to the word. 
I think that's so important because of this reason. They didn't have to be entertained. They weren't distracted. The word of God was not watered down. When they read God's word, they were there for God's word. And they were attentive to receive God's word. You've seen the, many of you, maybe the movie that came out several years ago. is an animated movie called Up. And uh, you see this old man with his house. And he, uh, he's on top of a mountain. And while he's there, he meets a, a pack of dogs. And the dogs are easily distracted. And uh, you remember the, 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 the word that's used when they would get distracted. They would, they would say squirrel. And they would jet off somewhere else. And for many of us, if we're not careful, we can read God's word just like we're doing today, but we're not paying, paying attention to God's word. And listen, if God's word is going to have the impact that it needs to have in our life, there's got to be attention to his word. Why is that important for us? It's important because for them, as they heard God's word, listen, this was their lifeline. This was their source of, of life. For them, when they heard God's word, because they hadn't heard it in a while, this was everything to them. And so they cherished every second they had as they heard God's word for five to six hours. Is that your thought process when you get up every day and you have an opportunity to get in God's word? Is that your thought process when you're sitting in life groups or on Wednesday night in a class or studying with some other people? Man, are you attentive to his word or are you just reading as a checklist? Are you just going through the motions just to get through it and say, I read today? For them, it was, hey, it was great attention. Why is that important for us? Because it gives us life in regards to kids and family and marriage and anger and lust. It deals with every avenue of life that we're going to deal with, and it was the source of life for them. You know, the average, the average number of people, believers, that read their Bible daily is? 30% of believers say they read their Bible on a daily basis. 30%, which means 70% don't. And when you think about that, can you imagine waking up and only eating food for two to three days out of the week, but the rest of the day is not eating whatsoever? Listen, if we don't get up and we don't pay attention to God's word daily, listen, we're going to miss out on what his plan and purpose is for our life, and we're going to struggle spiritually. But for them, there was an attention to God's word. What does it say next in verse 4 through 6? And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Matthiada, and Shema, and Aniah, and Uriah, and Hilkiah, and Messiah, on his right hand, and on his left hand, Padiah, and Mishael, and Micaiah, and Hashum, and Hashbadana, and Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up of their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Listen, there wasn't just an attention to God's word. There was a reverence for the word. Man, these people revered what they were hearing. Listen, we don't know much about the names of the guys that were mentioned that were right there with Ezra. But we do know this. We know there was a reverence among them. Man, they revered God's word at a high level. We've showed this video in the past, and I want to show just a small snippet of another group receiving God's word in their translation for the first time. And I want you to see their response as they receive God's word. Check this video out.
Do you see the appreciation and the reverence and the awe and the honor they had for God's word? Listen, folks, that every time I watch that video, it it just it does something to my heart. Conviction. Because the reality is this, in our church and other churches all around our county, there's a lost and found with more Bibles than you can count. In our church this morning, I counted, there's 20, over 20 Bibles in our lost and found. I don't know who they are, but the reality is this, and we've said this before, I'll never find 20 iPhones in a cabinet. You know why? Because you wouldn't make it to Wendy's for lunch without realizing that your precious iPhone is gone before you race back, bang on the doors to get it. You know why? Because you can't live without it. You know why many of us leave our Bibles behind, we don't read our Bibles? Because we've grown accustomed to living without it. We don't cherish it. We don't revere it. It's not the source of life. It's a part of life. And the reality of why we struggle so much is because we cherish more what we see outside the Bible than what we read inside the Bible. And so our lives, for many of us, our formation spiritually are things that we see outside of the world. And oftentimes in church, there's things that can be portrayed that are not biblical. And all the while, God's saying, hey, you want to know what truth is? Revere my word. Get into my Bible. You want to know how to live life? Get into my word. And just like you've seen for them, we need to learn to cherish God's word because, listen, one day we could wake up and this could be gone. Listen, for them, they waited and you could see they cherished it so much. So there was a reverence of God's word and you see that with Ezra and you see that with the people and their response is they began to read God's word, bowing down, saying amen. But it didn't stop there. Look in verse 7 and 8. It says, also, Yeshua and Bani, and Sherebiah, and Yaman, and Akub, and Shebathai, and Hodajai, and Messiah, Kalida, Azariah, Hozabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place, so they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, and they gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Listen, there was an understanding of the word. All those guys that they mentioned there, along with the Levites, you know what they were doing? Ezra's reading God's word aloud. But undoubtedly, there were people that were hearing God's word. They couldn't understand God's word. So there were other people that understood and knew God's word that were going around, and they were helping small groups of people understand the word. And listen, we need that today just like they had then. What does scripture say in Luke chapter 24 verse 45? It says, then Jesus opened the disciples' understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Listen, the Holy Spirit speaking through the word of God is how we understand scripture. And listen, we see that in God's word. I'm thankful for guys like Rusty Wheelington and my dad and David Snow and Mitch Martin, and others over the years that's taken the time to help me understand God's Word. Because there's things that I don't understand and I don't know, but I'm hungry to know and I want to know. And the question I want to ask in your life is this, do you have someone in your life that's helping you understand God's Word at a greater capacity? I mean, do you hunger and thirst and desire to have more of an understanding of God's Word? I hope all of us do. But I also hope this, I hope that you have a desire to help someone else understand God's word. I hope that you'll realize that you don't just want to keep the greatest treasure to yourself, that you want to take that to your kids and your home first and foremost. Listen, moms and dads, one of, the, one of the greatest joys in your life will be sitting down with your kids talking about Jesus and his word. And I'm just encouraging everybody here, man, that should be the passion of your life. 
It should be the desire of your heart that you don't depend on the church to teach your kids, that you desire yourself to understand the scriptures where you can, you can help your own family understand God's word. And we should all have that desire, but we should all hope to understand that it doesn't just stop with us. There's always someone else that we can be walking with through scripture. Are you doing that today? We talked about reestablishing the people. Listen, one of the greatest fulfillments in life will be you helping someone else grow in Christ spiritually. The greatest way you can do that is by praying for them and by helping them walk through God's word. And listen, there was an understanding of God's word. And we see a shift here. What happened when they understood? You're going to see this progression. What happened when they started understanding God's word? Look at what it says next, verse 9 and 10. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Listen, there was a conviction from the word. As they began to understand the word, there was a repentant heart, and there was conviction. Why? Because as they heard the law, they were reminded of what put them in bondage as they were swept away into captivity. They were reminded of what took place back in Egypt. They were reminded of all that stuff that took place in their life because of their sin. And when that took place, there was a conviction and there was a brokenness. This past Wednesday night, I'm grateful. We've got a, a young man in here named Jason Vandiver. Jason, where are you at? Just raise your hand. Jason's back there. Jason went to our recovery class this past Wednesday night. And man, God spoke to his heart through the word and he gave his life to Christ. We praise God for that. And Jason and I talked multiple times between Wednesday and Saturday, and it was funny because I got his number and called him on Friday, and we talked for a little while, and then a few hours later, I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize, and it was Jason, and I said, hey, what's going on, man? This is a different number. He said, man, yeah, I know. He said, man, God convicted me, and I know that I need to change some things, so I went ahead and threw away my old phone and got a new number because I don't need all those contacts. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Listen, folks, the word of God cuts deep. And when you hear the word of God, man, it will convict, and it will divide, and it will reveal and show you things in your life. When I read God's word, it reads me. You know what it does? It exposes my motives. It exposes my actions. It exposes my attitudes. When I hide things from other people, I can't hide from God through his word because when I read it through the Holy Spirit, it reads me. And so we need to read God's word. And as they begin to understand and read God's word, man, they begin to weep and mourn. And listen, Ezra and the Levites had to stop and say, hey, listen, it's cool that you're broken, but not today. Right emotion and response, but wrong day. This is a day of celebration. I don't want you to weep and mourn today. Look what it says in verse 11 and 12. So the Levites stilled all the people saying, hold your peace for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth. That means laughter because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Listen, the word of God is so strong that it will convict you but it will also comfort you. And it began to comfort them in that situation. Listen, there was a party once they understood the words and the setting. I'm sure they got some street rice and sweet tea, and they had a blast and a good time. And when we read God's word and we see what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, it says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Listen, when I read God's word, you know what it does? It comforts and encourages me. It helps me. It convicts me of my sin, and it comforts me and brings me hope. And I miss out on all that comfort and hope when I don't get in God's word. 
Man, they were comforted once they understood as they were hearing and reading the Word of God. We have another video I want to show you, and I love it. It's one of my favorites. And it's also about a group of people receiving God's Word. And I want you to just see the, the response and the emotions they have. It's kind of a blurry video, but it's a really, really cool deal. Check out this video. The word of God comforts, and it comforted them as soon as they received it, and it gives you hope and it gives me hope, but you got to read God's word and understand it in order to receive that comfort. So he offers that today. What else took place? Verse 13. And on the second day, they were gathered together, the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. Listen, there was a study in the word. And they never stopped growing. They were always continuing on in that growth. And you see even the leaders here, as they would go help other people, there was still room for them to grow. And so they would meet together and gather under Ezra's leadership to study God's word closely. Listen, are you continuing to grow and study God's word with other people? Or have you gotten complacent and stagnant in your life? On a weekly basis, we've got life groups at 9 o'clock that offers an opportunity for you to grow in God's word. On Wednesday nights, we've got a class on apologetics that people are coming to and they're learning things about God's word they didn't know before. We've got a class called Foundations for Every Believer that's, that teaches you things as a new and old believer that you may not know. There's always opportunities to grow and they were constantly growing there as they studied God's word. Verse 14 and 15, And they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of the Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month, and that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth into the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of thick trees to make booths as it is written. Listen, there was also praise from the word. There was a praise from the word. I mean, as they heard God's word, that led them to praise and do different things. And I've got a picture even today as they still celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles or, or booths that even today they still construct these booths just like was written in Scripture there. And they do that as a reminder of what God did in their life, as a memorial. And during this time, there's I mean, just a great feast and festival of praise as they dwell in these booths for several days remembering all that God has done. And listen, when you think back in your life and you look back to what God rescued you from, I hope that causes you to praise. I hope that causes you to get excited about what he has done and wants to do in your life. Check out this video as people praise centered around God's word. <laughs> <laughs> verse 16 and 17 so the people went forth and they brought them and they made themselves booths every one upon the roof of his house and in their courts and the courts of the house of God and the street of the water gate and the street of the gate of Ephraim and all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths and set under the booths for since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, unto the day had not the children of Israel done so. Listen, there was praise from the word, but there was also obedience of the word. How long had it been since they had celebrated like that? What does it say? It says since Joshua. Can you imagine the last time they had that type of celebration? Now, they had celebrated the Feast of the Tabernacles, but they hadn't celebrated the Feast of the Tabernacles quite like that. It compared to back when they entered into the promised land. 
that long ago. And that was the, the feast that they had and the party that they had. And there was a celebration. But guess what? There wasn't a celebration until there was first obedience. They had to be obedient to go gather. They had to be obedient to build. And they had to be obedient to praise. Listen, obedience brings celebration. And tonight, I mean, I hope you'll come back for vision night. One of the things we're going to do is we're going to celebrate, we're going to praise God for all the things that he has done, but we wouldn't be able to praise God for what he's done unless we had first been obedient to certain things that he asked us to do. So there was an obedience to the word. What happened when they were obedient? Look at the end of verse 17. And there was a very great gladness. Very great gladness. Once they constructed those booths, it gives three specific words. It could have just said there was gladness, but there wasn't just gladness. There was great gladness. It could have just said there was great gladness, but it wasn't just great gladness. So they added the word very. So there was very great gladness. In other words, man, there was a party going on, okay? They were excited about what had taken place. And there was a uh, a party I'm about to show you in a village when people begin to receive Christ and hear from God's word. Check this video out on rejoicing in the Lord. Village believers stating that he too believes that Christ has paid for his sins. Itao, which means it's true or it's good, it's very true. Village grammar rejoicing that he believes, so does she. Different ones giving testimony as to their belief in Christ as their sin bearer. Mark saying that if they really are believing, then God's word says that their sin is forgiven. Itao, it's good, it's true. Spontaneous rejoicing breaks out. This went on for two and a half hours. I'm not suggesting we do that today if someone gives their life to Christ, okay? But here's what I am saying. I'm saying we should be excited. I'm saying our faith should bring us joy. I'm saying that if we have Jesus and we have the Word, that should bring joy like nothing else. Listen, I've won a state championship in basketball in high school. I've won a national championship in AAU basketball, and we celebrated. But I've never celebrated and seen a celebration quite like that and quite like what took place when I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. And so for you in your life, when you think about the joy that comes from Christ and the joy that comes from God's Word, could you say that that's the joy that you receive when you get in God's Word on a daily basis? Listen, I realize there's days that things might not be what they seem or you may be struggling, but the reality is this. If you have Jesus in your life and you can get into God's Word, God's Word is going to bring joy. God's Word brought joy to the, the children of Israel. And God's, God's Word will bring joy to your life. Last but not least... Verse 18, and also day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read in the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the manner. Listen, last but not least, there was a continuation in the word. Listen, seven days of feasting around God's word. Listen, does it get any better than that? I mean, think about this. Every day, they're reading God's Word, and every day, they're eating the best food possible. Those two combinations are just an awesome thing. And so there, and they're feasting on food, but they're feasting on the Word of God, and they're doing it together. Listen, does God's Word mean that to you? When you think about reestablishing your life, if you're looking to figure out what's going on, 
What does God's word mean to you today? If you wanted your life to be reestablished, it happens first through Jesus. But if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the way you're going to grow and the way you're going to establish your steps is by getting into the word of God. And church, let me just encourage you, just like Nehemiah experienced and just like Ezra brought to the table to the people of God, it was so much more than just having a Bible. It was so much more than just a checklist. When you saw everything that took place in chapter 8, you see a people of God that are desiring and cherishing and understanding and reading and praising and experiencing conviction and comfort and all the things surrounding what takes place when you truly begin to dig in and desire and hunger after God's Word. Listen, for many of us in this room, we may have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but it's been, it's been a shallow, stifled relationship for years. And one of the reasons why that's taking place, if not the main reason, is this. We will never grow deeper with Christ until we learn to get into God's Word. Okay? We've got to begin to, to feed ourselves God's Word. And the crazy thing about it is this. Every day, for many of us, we walk around, and in our homes, we've got multiple copies of God's Word. And the very thing that we're searching for that we think is missing from our life is found in this treasure every single day. If you want help in your life and you want to grow in your life and you want to make Christianity less about you and more about him beginning to get in God's word. You know, I've realized in my life, I make my faith more about me and it's all selfishness when I'm not in God's word. But as I, as I begin to read God's word, you know what happens? The attention begins to get off of me and onto him and what he wants for my life. And that's what God wants for all of us. He wants us to be growing, established believers in Christ. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? You may be here and you may have heard this and go, Drew, I don't, I don't even have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, that's okay. This past week we had multiple people on Wednesday night that gave their life to Christ. And when they came here on Wednesday, they came, some of which didn't even have a Bible. And they heard God's word. And as they heard God's word, there was conviction in their heart, and they realized their need for Jesus Christ. You know what they did? They surrendered their life to him. They repented according to what God's word says. And when they repented of their sins and they surrendered their life to him, they began a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you desire a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, guess what? It, it's laid out in Scripture, but the reality is it's more than just saying you believe in Jesus. The Scripture says even the demons believe. It's not about just saying, hey, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. No, have you ever repented of your sins and surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? That's salvation. That's what Jesus is asking for all of us today. If you've never been to a place in your life where you've surrendered your life, you've repented from your sins, guess what? God offers that today. It's the free gift of salvation, but it wasn't free for him. Jesus went to the cross for your sins. He died a horrible death, was buried in the grave, but he didn't stay there. Three days later, he rose again, conquering sin and death, allowing you an opportunity today to begin a relationship with him. You know what that relationship does? That relationship. When you repent, you put your trust and faith in Christ. You know what that does? That washes away all your sin. That's the only thing that takes care of your sins. And today, Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart saying, hey, I want to begin a relationship with you. And because it's a free gift, he doesn't force it upon you. He gives you a free will and a choice in the matter. And if today you choose to follow him, you can begin that relationship. In just a moment, if you say, Drew, that's me, I want to begin a relationship with Jesus. In just a minute, our pastors are going to be down here at the front. All you've got to do is just come see one of these pastors and say, hey, I want to give my life to Christ. I want to repent of my sins, and I want to surrender today to him. If you're here and you're a child of God, you've been a Christian, let me ask you something. Do you cherish the word of God like you saw in those videos? When you wake up each day, Man, are you excited about running to get into God's Word because you treasure it and because you want to grow in your faith and it challenges you to be the man of God, the woman of God that God's called you to be? Or is it hit or miss or maybe just total neglect? 
Listen, maybe today God's wanting to reestablish your faith. The way he's going to reestablish your life, it's not just going to be by going back to church or getting more involved in church. There's got to be a place and time in your life when you begin to dig into God's word like you never have before. And you may say, Drew, I desire that, but man, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what to do or where to turn. Here's my call and challenge for you today. If you say, Drew, I want to grow in God's word, but I don't understand it. I don't know how. I'm going to ask you to come forward and find one of these pastors, if that's your desire, and just tell them, I want to grow in God's word. I want to learn more about him. And we'd be more than happy to begin to walk with you and get people to walk with you closely to help you study God's word. Listen, church, that's the desire of our heart at Fayette Baptist, but I know that's God's heart as well. So maybe today the change in your life needs to be it's time for me to get serious about God's word. And that could begin for some of you that know you need to be in it and do understand it by hitting this altar and just taking some time to repent. Just like you saw in Nehemiah chapter 8, as the people began to hear God's word, conviction fell upon them and they began to weep because they realized, man, what all God had done for them, but yet how much they had taken it for granted. Maybe that's you today. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for your word. God, thank you for the time of worship we've had today. God, thank you for the time of praise we've been able to experience. But God, also thank you for allowing us to read your word and to hear your word. Lord, I pray during this invitation time, God, that you would speak through your word. God, we know it doesn't return void. And Lord, I pray that it would change our hearts like never before. God, that we would cherish it like never before. God, that we would revere it like never before. God, that we would appreciate it like never before. And Lord, we would allow it to change us from the inside out. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me if God spoke in your heart? Because what we got here. Come now, fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to see thy grace. Streams of mercy never cease. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by plaining tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise.
It's been a good morning together at Fayette Baptist. Great time in life groups. Wonderful lesson today and a great time here together in worship. If you're visiting with us today, I want to encourage you to fill out the communication card. Uh, it's the white card in the seat in front of you. Uh, we've got many visitors that have been coming here lately, and we're so happy to have you here. Uh, if you would fill that out, let us know more about you. We'd love to connect with you in the days ahead. And then we have a green prayer and praise card. Let us know how we can pray for you this week, how we can celebrate alongside you this week. Um, and uh, those items plus your offering, uh, you can turn into the collection boxes that are located at the doors on your way out. And so, um, again, just so happy to have every one of you with us today. 
<clears throat> Pastor Drew mentioned it earlier, but tonight is our vision night. And uh, we're going to have a great time coming together and celebrating what God's been doing um, in, in the life of our church and the vision of, of our church that he has given us. And uh, we're going to talk about what is coming up and uh, the calendar for the, for the year, um, as well as just what, what God's leading us to do in the different vision frames that, uh, that our church has. So we're very excited about that. Uh, if you signed up for the dinner, it is 5.15 tonight, so make sure you're here for that. Um, and then the presentation service is at 6 o'clock. And so even if you didn't sign up for dinner, you're still more than welcome to join us at 6 o'clock for the service. We would love to have you here and be a part of that. We do have um, child care available for preschool kids, 0 to 5, um, tonight as well. So um, we are continuing to take deacon nominations through November 1st. And then also on November 1st is baby dedication day. Today is the deadline. If you have a young child that you're wanting to dedicate to the Lord, um, you need to let us know today. So Miss Laura Beach or Miss Heather Tower over in the kids wing, uh, let them know today or email the church uh, or Kristen at FayetteBaptist.com and uh, we will get that information. We're looking forward to that special day together. Baby Dedication Sunday, November 1st. Midweek at Fayette is normal week this week. Fellowship Mill at 515. The classes and ministries, lots of great places you can get plugged in. If you haven't been coming on Wednesday nights, it's not too late. Um, come join us, 615. Lots of great classes and ministries that you can be a part of. And then just one housekeeping thing real quick. Uh, it's kind of been a little bit confusing for some, so I just want to let y'all know what's going on with our back parking lot. Um, on Wednesdays, we leave that back parking lot blocked off because we still have kids from school that are that are finishing up playing out there. And we also have kids from church and teenagers from church that are using kind of that recreation space back there. So we're just keeping cars from pulling around back there. Uh, so when you see the cones out, please know uh, that we do not have parking in the back. But on Sundays, that parking is open, especially for our senior adults and our handicapped um, those that need handicap parking, it is open on those days. So please make sure that you do not block that off. Um, I know sometimes people have been parking there when the cones are there. But on Sundays, make sure you leave that drive open so that people can park back here behind the building and have easy access into the church. Pastor Drew. Families looking ready to join. Mark and Hallie Cooper. Where y'all at? Mark and Hallie. Mark, Hallie, come on up here. Mark and Hallie have been visiting our church for a while, and I've uh, gotten to know Mark over the years. And man, we're so grateful for God bringing them here. And uh, they're excited about being a part of the fellowship. And we were laughing and cutting up today in Connect class about a few things. And I know God's going to use them in a mighty way and uh, has gifted them in specific ways to be a blessing through this local body. If you're excited about that, would you just say amen? We're praying for them in the days to come. They get plugged in. Also, we've got Eli Taylor. Where is Eli at? Eli coming up here. Eli, um, as you were here, you saw a few weeks ago, Eli made a decision um, for the Lord to be, uh, for God to be the Lord of his life. He made, made a decision to get saved. He was baptized. He's gotten plugged into our Common Ground ministry. And if you're excited about Eli coming on board here and being a member, would you say amen? And then last but not least, where is Takeda Purrier at? Takeda, where are you at? Come on up here. Takeda's been coming to our church for a while as well. And uh, we've been blessed to have her on Sundays and Wednesdays. And she's been growing and understanding more about Jesus. She's ready to jump in as well, and uh, we're excited about that. If you are too, would you say amen? Amen. Praise God for all his family. Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. When we finish here in just a second, come by and greet them before you leave and encourage them as they get plugged in. If you're here today visiting with us, uh, we'd love to meet you. I'd love to meet you before you leave. In the back, we have a reception room with a free gift for you and your family. If you get a chance and can stop by before you go, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. I think that is it. So, are you good? All right. If you'll stand, we'll go ahead and pray and be dismissed. There are going to be those setting up tables for tonight here in the worship center, so don't mind them stacking chairs and getting things set up. You're welcome to join us if you'd like to. Let's pray. 
God, thank you so much for your word, God, and how it speaks to us, changes us, God. God, how it allows us to communicate with you and have that intimate relationship with you, Lord. We praise you and thank you for the word of God. God, thank you for it being proclaimed and preached each and every Sunday here by our pastor. God, for being taught in life groups and on Wednesday nights, God, and to our children, to our youth, to our college. God, thank you so much for what you're doing through your word. And God, we praise you and thank you for those that have joined together with our church this morning. God, we pray that you would bless them, Lord, that you would use them in a mighty way, God, to come alongside and find their place, God, of service. God, find their place to, to be discipled and to disciple others. God, I pray that they would, uh, God, just have a, a wonderful group of people come around them, Lord, and build some wonderful community and relationships here through our church family. So, God, we praise you and thank you for them. God, we look forward to tonight. God, bring us back here safely to celebrate the things that you've done, God, and the things that you're calling us to do. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen.